Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of Bonus. For the gameplay this week, we've got something a little bit different. It's uh, an indie PC game called Nithog. Best described as a lo-fi fencing simulator, in which I'll be taking on a series of ever-increasing in difficulty AI opponents. It's uh, rather reminiscent of Bushido Blade. It's very fast-paced, very brutal, one hit will kill you, and uh, very easy to die, but very easy to kill as well. It's quite satisfying, and you can do some quite impressive stuff. Anyway, we've entered the penultimate week of my Call of Duty Ghost Weapon Guides, and as of now, the LSAT Guide should be live on my main channel. That's episode 23 out of a total of 30, so by the end of this week there will just be four episodes left, which is exciting, it is exciting. But none of you guys care about Call of Duty Ghosts, you only care about the questions. Ra van der Waal says, Hello Stu, I've heard that Titanfall will be on a 6v6 base. For me, it seems like an old gen choice. The fact that the game will be filled up with AI seems a bit simple to me. What are your thoughts about this? Are you okay with 6v6, or would you like to see something like 12v12 or more? Oh yes, earlier this week this was quite the controversy, the announcement that Titanfall would only be 6v6. Although to be honest, I think what little controversy there was has been overblown by the media. I mean, I always expected the game to be, you know, a similar player count to COD. I wasn't really expecting, you know, 32 players on each side or anything like that. But someone somewhere has certainly been disappointed because it's certainly been the, uh, the hot topic this week. But I'm not bothered. I mean, if the game is designed for 6v6, then the game is designed for 6v6. I don't really think it's a question of next gen or a last gen decision. I think it's just what the game is designed for. I mean, nobody complains about chess being a, a two player game. That being said, I do think that large scale multiplayer battles can be epic and exciting, and, you know, games like Planetside and Battlefield do this really well. It can be quite difficult to balance, however, and I'm pretty sure anybody who's played 64 players on, on Metro or Operation Locker and Battlefield will know that you know, maybe sometimes it's okay to have slightly fewer players. Again, it depends on the map, it depends on the game, and you've, it's about finding a balance. You know, too many players, everything's crowded, everything's a, a cluster fudge, too few, and the game slows down, it becomes boring, and the game turns into hide and seek. I think at this stage, at this pre-release stage, you've kind of you've got to trust the developers a little bit. Hopefully the player cap is a decision that's been made for the sake of gameplay rather than any technical limitation. And so hopefully the maps and the balance with the AI grunts and the titans dropping from the sky, hopefully you should still feel pretty action-packed and you know fast-paced without ever feeling sparse. But time will tell, eh? And uh, the review scores in, in mid-March will probably uh, reveal a bit more about how successful the design goals on Titanfall are. I remain optimistic, however. It's got to be better than Ghosts, right? LFNFAL says, Hey Stu, when you finish the Ghosts weapon guides, will you finish the gore video? Yes, this is one video I've got penciled in as a definite between Ghosts and Titanfall. I've got several hours of gore footage recorded already, and I've done some research on, on that particular front, so I'm pretty well set to finish it off. I do have to write a script, however, and I will have to do some additional research and possibly record some additional games, so there's a bit of work involved. I'm going to reuse the uh, brief history of format, which means the graphical style of things is already done. I'll just change the colour up, so instead of uh, electric salmon, it will be uh, blood red. Of course, that's the most fitting colour for a gore video. And I'll be giving myself about a week to write everything and edit it and record anything else that I might need. That's quite a tight time budget, but it kind of forces me to just finish it up. My expected runtime is about 10 minutes, I think. That's a good length. Not quite as long as the inaugural Brief History video, but then we're covering a narrower subject, so uh, we'll see how it works. We'll see. I'm already bracing myself for a whole barrage of comments saying, Stu, you forgot to include this game which had a drop of blood in it. You f how could you forget that game? It had blood. Yeah. I guess, I guess comments like that are just par for the course. I should accept them. People are going to complain about games you missed out in these sort of big compilation videos. On the plus side, at least it shows they were paying attention. Maurizio Bro says, Stu, instead of beer, let's talk about wine. Dun dun dun! Do you like wine? I like wine, but I don't like wine, if you know what I mean. Like, give me a glass of wine, and I'm like, thank you, thank you for the glass of wine. I shall drink this, and I shall enjoy it. But if you ask me, what's your favourite vintage of Shiraz, I will look at you blankly. Basically, what I'm trying to say is I'm a filthy wine casual. Same goes for coffee. I like coffee, I just don't like coffee. I've been making a lot of use of my Nespresso machine that I got for Christmas. Now, Nespresso, it's one of these little pod things. It's wasteful, 
but it's oh so convenient and it makes adequate coffee and I like that. Coffee that's adequate and it's easy, so easy. Just pop a pod in, press the button, coffee comes. Brilliant. Phil S. 414 says, I never understood how that PewDiePie is so popular. I just find him so annoying and childish. Now, I don't, I'm not like an avid watcher of PewDiePie. PewDiePie! <clears throat> but I, I do, I sometimes, I, you know, I'll check. Like, you, I mean, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't occasionally look at popular YouTubers and just to see what they were doing. And I've got to say, all right, yes, you look, look, PewDiePie is childish, puerile, and overly loud in some videos. But, I mean, he certainly puts a lot of effort into them. The editing's not bad on most of them. And he's charismatic. He's good looking. I mean, he's a handsome fellow. I mean, in my opinion, what do I know? I'm just a heterosexual male. Uh, <laughs> But when you wrap all this in a, you know, into a package that plays video games and is rather prolific, I mean, PewDiePie produces a lot of videos. He's found the perfect formula, and consider that, you know, the gaming scene is is generally quite young. It's it's little wonder he's found a huge audience. There's a lot of kids out there who like video games. A lot of kids out there with a lot of free time, and so good for him. You know, he's found something which he can make a very good living off and entertains a lot of people. What I'm basically trying to say is that I like PewDiePie, but I don't like PewDiePie. <laughs> Thomas Foster says, What is your opinion on the human exploration of space? Is it an essential part of human curiosity, or is it just a waste of money? I am very pro-science, so I do like to see money being spent on stuff like space exploration and other scientific endeavours. I really do. Now, it's quite easy to fall into the mindset, you know, what's the point of going to the moon? All we did is put a flag there. And not every scientific research project actually produces fruitful results, but it's the chance of discovering something. That's what makes investment in science worthwhile. Of course, you know, there were lots of ancillary benefits to NASA's efforts to get to the moon, and, uh, you know, we enjoy many of those benefits today. I believe um, Velcro was a direct offshoot of NASA research. Microwaves as well, maybe? So yeah, as far as taxpayers' money and uh, spending and all that, I don't mind seeing it being spent on scientific endeavours. If we were to cut anything, I'd sooner see military budgets cut. But we're on the verge of getting rather too political here, so let's just leave it at that. XM Barrett says, Do you still use your Xbox 360 at all? And have you played any of the Dead Rising games? If so, what do you think about them? To be honest, my Xbox 360 has been rather idle since I got the X1. It's kind of a shame, because, well, there's a bit of a drought of next-gen games at the minute, and there's a few titles I wouldn't mind playing on the 360, but, well, I'm spending most of my time producing Ghosts guides at the minute, so it's not like I've got too much free time. As far as Dead Rising is concerned, I have, um, I've played the first one and the second one. I haven't yet played the third one, I haven't picked it up for Xbox One. The games are too expensive, they're all like 45 quid. I can't afford that. Anyway, I'm not really the biggest fan of the series. The second one was better than the first one, and I understand the third one is better still. But I can I can live with giving it a miss for now. Um, I'd sooner play Rise. I'm waiting for that to drop to £25 used. I think that's about my breaking point. It's not the best game in the world, and it's quite short, but I still kind of want to play it. Tizer30 says, Do you like stand-up comedy? If so, do you have any favourite comedians? And do you enjoy dark comedy, or something lighter? Overall, I probably do fall onto the dark side of comedy. I, I do quite like stuff which is self-aware and has a cynical edge. One of my favourite comedians, Stuart Lee. He has kind of a deconstructivist approach, which uh, some people find uh, annoying, shall we say. But I like it, I like it, and uh, he does a good shaggy dog story as well. I normally make an effort to see Stuart Lee whenever he's round in Manchester. I see him about once a year, typically, so yeah, he's definitely my favourite by, by quite some distance. I also like his ex-colleague, uh, Richard Herring. Simon Amstel's pretty good as well. Beyond that, I'm actually quite content to, to watch most stand-up comics. You know, as long as it's not Michael McIntyre, I'm, I'm happy enough to watch. There are some pretty good American comics as well. Uh, Doug Stanhope's pretty good. Louis C.K. is pretty good as well, and then of course you've got people like George Carlin, Mitch Hedberg, both of whom are, shall we say, less active than they used to be, but their old work is still enjoyable. George Walton says, Hello Stu, I just wondered what your opinion is on the sexualization of women in video games. Do you think that it means that there will always be a lack of female protagonists in future games? Oh, a thorny subject, this whole gender politics and video games thing. It's all about a balance. Really, when it comes to issues like this, I think it's okay for a video game to have a sexualized female in it, but it's not okay when every female is sexualized within video games. 
I mean, ultimately, video games are art, and it should be okay to include anything in a work of art, no matter how controversial, no matter how offensive, really. I mean, that's it, art needs to be protected. Anything else is censorship, which well, I believe is a bad thing. That being said, I would like to see more female protagonists. I mean, it would be nice if we lived in a world where the number of female to male protagonists in video games and films and books and everything was representative of the population as a whole. Unfortunately, it isn't the case, and if you look at even like the film Top 10, it's all male hero does something. I mean, look at The Hobbit, it's a sausage fest. Now, the book was written in 1937, so you can forgive the base material for being, you know, of its time. And like I say, it's okay. It's okay for the odd film to have a sausage fest of heroes. But I do think it's important to ask why, when, you know, it's apparent that there is a major trend throughout the industry. So if you want to have a, uh, a bikini beach volleyball game with buxom women bouncing a ball backwards and forth, then that's fine. That's fine. But... That being said, if there's no male equivalent with oiled up Adonis type characters with posing pouches flapping merrily in the sun, then maybe there's a problem. And if that imagery made you feel a little bit disgusted, then maybe you're a little bit homophobic. I'm presuming you're male in this instance, if you're female you can ignore that bit. Anyway, I should stop talking about this before I get told to check my privilege. Moving on. Luca Crush 3 r 96 says, Hey Stu, when is the AK week coming? You mentioned that in one of your previous bonus videos, i.e. you want to bring the Behind the Line series back. AK week is on the drawing board, but it is not yet in the pipeline, meaning I don't have a planned time for this. It's not likely I'll have enough time to produce everything between the end of COD Ghosts and the start of Titanfall, so that means it's not going to be any time before March, April, May, any time like that. There is a chance it will fall between Titanfall and Destiny in September. But that being said, a new concept like AK Week and a variety of videos, which would probably take me about a month to produce, is quite a risky endeavour. So at this stage, it's something I'd like to do, but I'm not really in the position to take the risk yet. My first priority is ensuring my continued survival on YouTube and finding a, a strong audience with Titanfall. After that, we'll see where YouTube takes us. Reboy GTR says, Hey Stu, you mentioned in bonus number 7 that you used to be a DJ back in the day. What kind of DJ did you used to be? Did you play in clubs, or just the bedroom? Me and a friend used to do two nights a week in the bars of Sunderland. We used to do student nights. We were quite ahead of our time, you know. Um, I had a sizable MP3 collection, and we it was kind of a request night that we did, but the, the shtick was that you could request literally anything. And the, uh, the breadth of my MP3 collection meant that we could satisfy a lot of surprising requests. So it was a really eclectic blend of, you know, the popular stuff, the student classics, with uh, some more obscure album tracks, things like that. And it was our job as DJs to kind of blend them into a, a unified night. I mean, it's not always easy to segue from, like, heavy metal into to the latest pop classics, but somehow we pulled it off. DCJ Snowy Hell says, Hey Stu, if some AAA company like Apple made a console, would you be interested in it? Well, if there was a new console on the market, I'd certainly pay attention. But it is worth noting that Apple have already tried to make their own video game console. It didn't go well. It was called the Pippin, and it was essentially an underpowered Macintosh from the, uh, the darker days of Apple. That, uh, yeah, it didn't sell very well at all. It didn't really have any games. According to Apple, Pippin was directed at the home market as an integral part of the consumer AV stereo and TV environment. Hey, it sounds like the Xbox One. Black Art Film says, Hey Stu, I know it's a tiny detail for games, but I really love the look of weapons that are chipped and scratched. It makes them feel more worn and battle-scarred. Especially like the AK-74M back in Battlefield 3. I was thinking, what if, as you got kills with a weapon, the texture got more and more rough around the edges to show the amount of time it's seen? I think it'd be a really cool way to add a little immersion and give the weapon some personality. What do you think? And do you ever have ideas like this that you think could subtly add something to games? It is a cool idea, and I have thought about this before. Like, if you got like 10,000 kills of the weapon in COD, if you unlocked like a new camouflage, like dinged up camo, that'd be quite nice. To really do it properly though, to really sort of simulate gradual wear and tear on a weapon, it would take a lot of resources. I mean, to have near infinite combinations of tiny scratches, dirt marks, thumbprints, and all the rest of it. It would take a lot of textures, it would take a lot of memory work, and it, I don't know. It's uh, so many resources for something that could be used for something arguably better. 
That being said though, I do think it could work quite well in an RPG. I'd really love to see a game that was based around your relationship with your rifle. Like, some sort of intimate connection between you and your gun. The survival horror series would probably be best for this, and maybe make it an FPS so you can actually see your gun more closely. But instead of having this ever-increasing ramp of better gun after better gun, you know, like, you, you, you kill an enemy, you, you look at his gun, determine whether it's better than yours, and then you trade it. You've got no connection to the last gun you're using, because you only used it for a little bit. Instead, make it so that you build up this relationship with your gun. Make it so that you start with a really good rifle, and you're never really presented with a procession of better guns. I mean, a gun is a gun, but this gun is your gun. And let it get dinged up, let it get modified by you, maybe. And if you want to paint it or re-blue it, then maybe make that an option. I think it could be really interesting from a narrative point of view. I mean, there's the obvious trope of taking that gun away from you. I think if a game could successfully build a bond between a man and his rifle to the point where you feel devastated when you lose it, I think that could be really strong, and I think that could be good. It's an area not often explored in shooters. I mean, they're not really known for their rich narrative and, and building of a bond, are they? Deadly Aztec 27 says, Hey there, Stu, what type of pants do you prefer? Denim, dress, or business, khaki, cargo, or do you prefer shorts? Most of the time, you'll probably find me slobbing around the house in shorts. I don't wear them outside often, but indoors, it's all shorts weather. Outside in the real world, you'd most often find me in jeans, unless there was a need for something more dressy. The Vaseline God says, Dearest Stuart Brown, hopefully you might answer this time. Seeing as you are a fan of Fallout, what do you think of survival slash apocalypse games and or movies? I rather enjoy them, you know? There's a combination of two factors that makes me like apocalyptic fiction. The first is the fact that the removal of civilization gives any protagonist absolute freedom to do as they please. If you want to shoot a man in his face for his hat, you can do that. It's the apocalypse. What are you going to do? Call the police? Second of all, it's also got quite a clear call to action, uh, even if that call to action is just survive. Which is a whole lot more exciting than the real world, in which, you know, the primary call to action is earn enough money to live. Go to work. So yeah, from a fictional point of view, Apocalypse good. It's a wonderful form of escapism. I'd dearly love to make my own apocalyptic RPG, in which you've got to rummage through people's houses looking for beef jerky. Dan Ortho says, Hey Stu, I have never drunk beer before, or any alcoholic beverage for that matter. Just for fun, in your own words, describe what your favourite beer, or one of your favourites, tastes like, as if you were explaining it to someone who's never had it. Beer is like liquid bread that makes you feel happy. That's about the shortest way of putting it. But yeah, beer is, it's kind of a cereal drink, isn't it? It's uh, malted barley. So you've just got this body of carbohydrates that... You know, it's, it's nourishing and and it has kind of these uh, savoury flavours about it. It's kind of subtle, but it's it's nice. And then you've got the fermentation character where yeast is introduced, and obviously you've got the acerbic nature of the alcohol, which varies from very slight to quite strong. And then you've got sort of other byproducts. You've got aromatic esters, uh, it can be stuff that smells like bananas or cloves, more complex flavours. And the yeast also produces acids, so you've got kind of a sour note in some beers as well, which can be quite pleasant. Then added to this mix, you've got the hops, which are a herbal additive which preserve the beer and also give it a, a bitter and aromatic flavour. Now, in an ideal beer, these will be balanced with the major flavours, but like chocolate or uh, coffee, bitterness doesn't always have to be bad, and it can, you know, for some, add to the taste of a beer. And that's about it. Three ingredients to most typical beers, uh, four if you include water but these few variables can yield a huge and astonishing range of beers. Hyrafax says, Stu, even though your birthday won't be happening for quite some time, you're going to need to open a P.O. box so that we can send you presents. Just saying. You are right, of course, and I might sort this out for August or sometime before, but it's 300 quid for a P.O. box. 300 quid! That's for a year, but still, oh, it's a bit of pill to swallow. John Juancic says, Please tell us what happened to Retro Hoy. It's been well over a year. Do I unsubscribe? I don't have any immediate plans to upload anything to the channel. I would like to do more retro content, but I'm kind of inclined to put it on my main channel. So, I mean, you, you can unsubscribe if you like. I won't be offended. But it is possible that contractual changes in the future might make Retro Hoy a viable path for me to follow again. We'll see. Anyway, we're hitting the 20 minute mark and I've yet to render and upload this video yet, and it's already past 4pm on a Wednesday. 
so I mustn't linger for too long, so I shall bid you farewell. It is only for me to carry on with the breakneck pace of the Ghosts videos and hope that I don't fall apart during. So here's to my continued mental health, and until next time, farewell.